Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, another webinar hosted by DT. My name is Joe, um, head of support here at Digital Transitions. Um, we are going to wait for kind of a couple minutes, and uh, I just want to welcome all of you guys uh, to joining us today for you know the the webinar uh, regarding you know social distancing and shooting. Uh, we have you know we have George here. You can see on his uh, camera, and hey, then um, and uh, we have a presentation, and we also have uh, the you know the webcam on the camera itself. So we're just going to wait a couple minutes and um, make sure people are joining and then we can get it started. How's everyone doing? Doing good? Everyone, uh, let's see, people are saying that they're from San Francisco, from Denver. Very good. From LA. All right. Right. Norway, Norway. Minneapolis. We're, we're covering a lot of grounds here. That's great. That's great. Good from Maryland, Georgia, a popular guy, dude. All right. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, let's see. All right, so let's kind of get started. Um, you know, today we'll be talking about, you know, because the, you know, everyone knows because the pandemic, we, everyone has to kind of act uh, a little bit differently on how we normally used to act, you know, especially on set or doing our jobs, whether, you know, we're shooting or we're teching or doing uh, pr uh, producing or doing makeup, things are a little bit different. So that's what we're going to be focused on today is, you know, how to handle these kind of situations on set. Um, you know, digital transitions, we will be kind of going over what technologies are available, um, you know, through phase and through capture one and, you know, with, um, George's expertise, um, being on set, he can give us some like real world examples, um, you know, how these technology fits in. Okay. So, um, George is based out of LA. A lot of you guys probably know, um, George, I'm going to hand it off to you. Kind of give you a little <laughs> introduction. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm George. I'm a digital tech. I'm sure probably most of you guys here already know what that means. But um, for the few of you who might not, um, that means that I run tethered capture on large photo shoots. I'm in charge of file management, processing, delivery. And uh, one of the other big things that digital techs also handle is uh, monitoring. So that puts us in a pretty unique position uh, to be able to help photographers, producers, clients uh, work remotely, social distance on set. Um, so very excited that Digital Transitions has invited me to speak today about some of those solutions. And um, yeah, let's let's get into it. Okay. Uh, in in the crowd as well, you will see uh, Arnab Chatterjee. He's our you know technical guru. He will be handling the chat. Any questions that you have for me or George or in general, uh, you can post it in chat, and you know he will kind of monitor that. And, uh, and the, the fourth person is Carson. He's a new addition to DT. Normally you guys probably uh, remember Kate who kind of handles the day-to-day the -day events and marketing and Carson has taken a big step towards that. So welcome Carson. Um, so let's get, let's get started, okay? So you know, today's topic, we're gonna kind of talk about starting from the very top is just the general safety of you know, being um, around people, you know, how to handle, uh, on set when you have multiple people around you and how to handle that distance and how to handle equipment through that. Uh, second topic of course is handle the, the cleaning of the equipment. You know, when you're handing off or, you know, as a digital tech, you will be using equipment from set to set with different people. How do you handle that, uh, equipment cleaning and, uh, from set to set or from job to job? Tethering, of course, sharing on set, uh, kind of some of the remote control capabilities we have through Capture One, Phase One, or other applications. 
um, and other streaming tips and remote tips. And at the end, we'll have a, a Q&A session, okay? Uh, so let's kind of go get right into it. Why is this uh, so important? You know, I, I think uh, when, when this pandemic started, you know, a lot of people are not sure what's going on. But, you know, one thing I've taken, understand, um, you know, taking into consideration is that the reason why we're wearing masks or, you know, keeping our distance from other people is not really just to protect ourselves, but it's to protect people around us so that they can protect the people that they're close to, right? So, you know, it's, it's more of looking out for each other. And I think that's where this topic comes in, okay? Uh, for general safety, of course, you know, social distancing, um, six feet away during on set. So what we're looking at, you know, if you take a look behind me here, I have set up the camera. Uh, you can see the camera. So I'm kind of trying to demonstrate that later on in Capture One, how we can achieve if photographer is handling the camera, digital tech can be far away. And, or if there's a still life set, the, you know, the stylist can be over there and the photographer can be here where I am right now. So there's a couple options there. So, you know, keep yourself distance uh, from other people if possible, when possible, okay? Um, PPE wise, you know, we're talking about face masks. Uh, we talk about, you know, regular masks and we're talking about gloves, right? You know, uh, respiratory, respiratory drops and things like that is the number one cause for, you know, transmission. So, you know, that's very important. And George, you know, since we kind of, we always hear about this in the news, you actually let us know that you took a couple of jobs, you know, while LA was kind of opening up a little bit and then mm -hmm. now kind of, you know, going back, can you just give us a little, little bit of experience on what it looks like on set uh, in terms of how to deal with, uh, uh, you know, people's role and how you handle that, that situation? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, uh, every, every department's role looks very different now than it did six months ago uh, in this pandemic. Um, I think, you know, the biggest thing I've seen is um, productions making a valiant effort to put some of these protocols in place when it comes to social distancing, hand washing, PPE, definitely have seen great compliance with people wearing masks on set. Um, but, you know, despite everyone's best efforts, I think the reality of our industry is that we all work very collaboratively together. A lot of our jobs require close contact, whether that's, you know, hair and makeup or whether that's photo assistants, you know, working collaboratively to put up a big light. Um, so uh, the, the social distancing, in my experience, has definitely been the biggest challenge, um, both to actually do and to enforce. Um, and that's why I'm a huge advocate for keeping crew sizes as absolutely small as possible, because I think um, that's something I'd like to see more of. I've seen pretty like large crews working on some of the jobs I've been on. And um, yeah, I mean, I just think it, if you had two assistants before, you might need one now, um, might need to get by. And just the, the key thing is like slowing everything down and, um, you know, just taking the time that you need to make sure that safety is the number one priority. Um, so. Oh, can't hear you, Joe. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, couple things to kind of check, you know, check the temperatures and, you know, even have um, someone who's enforcing the rules, right? A lot of times when we are on set and things get busy, uh, sometimes we just kind of be, we become a little bit lax on these protocols or procedures. And to have someone to kind of be kind of outside of that, just like, you know, you have to wear a mask, let's keep our distance away and, you know, wash your hands every 30 minutes and so on and so forth. It's just a good practice to keep everyone safe. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, in terms of having, I just want to add there, in terms of having like a dedicated person on set who can be the one who's overseeing and enforcing all of that. Um, a lot of, I, that's not something that I've actually had experience with on any of the jobs I've worked on so far. I know that's actually a mandate in New York, but it's not here. Um, and from the conversations I've had with producers, um, the general consensus there is like, the producer has a lot on their plate already. Uh, it's pretty important that they be liked by everybody on the crew. And that person who, you know, it's, it's awkward to enforce this stuff. Um, even personally, you know, things I've seen that I've felt less than comfortable with, I haven't really felt okay with like calling somebody out directly on that. And I think it's really important that that responsibility falls on somebody who, you know, like it or not, it's their job to be the bad guy. Um,
I definitely agree. You know, sometimes feelings are hurt, but you know, uh, you know, looking at a broader sense, you know, what we're trying to do is essentially just keep everyone safe and everyone healthy. Okay. So let's kind of look into the next part. You know, one of the questions that we got, we get a lot, uh, whether it's through the, the commercial sector or the, the cultural heritage sector, is how to clean the equipment that are being shared. Right. So for DT, we have equipment rentals. We rent out equipment for photographers and they come back. Uh, George, I'm sure you have equipment that's on set that's loaned out to you know, other techs or photographers. and Everyone's kind of touching it. So how do we handle uh, these type of um, scenarios? Right. So one thing we found at DT is that, you know, you. You know, of course, if you can get Clorox wipes, that's fine. But right now they're. First, expensive. Second, hard to come by, right? There's a, a huge shortage of these things. So, you know, when you get these like pre-made wipes, you just want to make sure that, you know, you don't have too much liquid so that, you know, the liquid doesn't get, to get into your electronics. Um, George brought out a point is that you can actually mix isopropyl alcohol and to use that to clean off your, um, clean off uh, the equipment. And, um, the reason why the 99% is not as great as the 70% is because the alcohol actually dries too quick. You know, for all these disinfectants to work, they actually have to be a time where the liquid is on the surface, what they call the dwell time, I guess. Um, so when that happens, if it's dry too quick, too quick, it becomes less effective to kill the, you know, the viruses or the germs. Um, what are your thoughts on that, George? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, everything you said is great there. I just want to point out a couple things I'm seeing in the comments regarding this. You know, first off, I just want to say I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an infectious disease specialist. Um, but I have done a little bit of research on this topic just to keep myself and my clients safe. And I saw somebody mentioned uh, when it comes to isopropyl alcohol. Here we're mentioning the different percentages of the solution. Um, at first, I thought that maybe using 99% alcohol as a cleaner was going to be the best option because uh, I know it's safe for electronics. Turns out based on the research I've done that, like Joe was saying, that dwell time is really important and um, an alcohol solution with less alcohol um, and more distilled water uh, is, is going to have that longer dwell time and be more effective at killing uh, the virus. So that's the route I've gone with. Um, that seems to be the safer option. Uh, I just want to also mention that uh, if you are using other types of disinfectant wipes, uh, you really want to make sure uh, that they do not contain bleach. Uh, I see Brian called that out in the comments, and that's really important. You definitely don't want to be using anything with bleach in it um, around electronics. So, um, yeah, something to keep in mind for sure. You know, so, and, you know, in that, in that sense, you know, wipe down the cables. Cable is being handled all the time. And one thing is not just when you're talking about cameras, we're not just talking about the, the grip itself, right? We're talking about the eye cups. We're talking about the lens barrels, um, things in that nature with, you know, where the touch it, you know, where your hands are being touched. Uh, these surfaces need to be kind of wiped down for the next client to be used. So, you know, be kind of vigilant about these areas. Eye cups can be removed. We're talking about the XF. We can remove the eye cups. The grips are, you know, of course, not removable. But lenses, you can just cleanly wipe the, the barrels, but don't use the, you know, the alcohol to clean your actual lens, uh, lens cells. You know, those will essentially destroy your coating and it's not good for the lens. You should use regular lens cleaners uh, for, for that stuff. Okay. And hopefully you're not touching or coughing on your optics in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the, you know, the general consensus with kind of distancing yourself, uh, protect yourself from other and protect others from, you know, from yourself as well. And how to clean equipment when you're handing, handing off to them. Um, you know, so the next part we want to kind of talk about is what is possible in terms of technology in, in the phase, um, you know, with uh, phase one uh, to keep photographers, digital techs, or stylists or producers kind of away from each other while keeping the same workflow and keeping the same efficiency, okay? So if you take a look at it right now, I'm gonna just quickly share my screen here. There we 
with me. Oh, not that one. Give me a second. Oh, I don't know. Let's see here. Bear with me. Why isn't it? Doesn't seem like to detect my other screen. Joe, while you're figuring that out, I just also wanted to mention um, the last thing you said about handing off equipment between people. And, um, you know, obviously lenses, batteries are, are things that in the past have been handed off between assistants and photographers a lot. Um, and what I've been encouraging my clients to do, uh, I've been putting all of the lenses and you know, batteries, other accessories that they might need in a small camera bag that I kind of just give them and put next to them and say, hey, if you don't mind, I think it'd be best if you do your own lens changes today. Um, you know, obviously if they say, no, I'd rather not, I'll, you know, sanitize everything in between swaps and do it myself. But I think that if photographers can kind of get on board with that idea of like doing a little bit more on their own, um, I think that's like the best thing that we can do to avoid that uh, cross-contamination for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, let me just, I'm gonna try a different browser. Just bear with me, I might drop off. All right, here we go. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yep. I think that was like a little browser issue here. So, so you know, a couple of things. So what we're looking at is, you know, phase one IQ4, you have a couple connectivity uh, options, right? So in terms of the IQ, what we have is just, you know, a digital back here. You can see the camera body on the other side. But what we have, is a normal USB connection, uh, USB type C, USB 3.1, uh, you know, and these cables can normally by default allow up to kind of nine feet of distance from the camera and nine feet, you know, granted is more than six feet, but it usually is not long enough um, even for the photographer to kind of move around, right? So, you know, if you are looking at, um, to kind of keeping, a further distance away, we highly recommend, um, you know, active extension cables. So we have cables that's called, uh, it's a, by StarTech, that allows uh, extend extension of 10 feet, 15, and 30. So that way, you know, between the computer and, you know, the set, you can add additional distance. Because, right, the photographer will be continuous to shooting where the camera is, where the digital tech will be continuous to work. Uh, at the you know at the at the computer station, so that's one of the things. And with um, Phase One IQ4, you have the capability of using uh, USB Type C uh, power delivery port to actually charge the back or charge the system, so that there's less handling of the camera. Right, uh, George doesn't need to go to a photographer's. I left switch out the battery because the entire system is continuously being charged through the USB-C port, okay? So that's one of the options to kind of keep yourself away from the, the you know, the set itself. But one thing, um, you know, the second option, which I wanna kind of talk about a little bit uh, further is the RJ45 connection. Um, so if you take a look at digital back, you have, what we have is an ethernet connection on the back itself, okay? So, if you take a look at right now how the setup is right now my computer uh there's no cable essentially running between my camera to the to the computer itself the the the, the camera is run to a switch in the back office and so is the computer so at this point what we're doing is actually utilizing a, a switch or just a local network to connect the computer to the camera okay so I can be actually in a completely separate room, you know, uh, in the back office while the photographer or the stylist work on set so that we can, you know, keep ourselves away from each other and keep each other safe in that perspective. So if you take a look at right now, um, you know, capture one, 
all I have to do is kind of select whatever, you know, since the digital back populates, um, auto, you know, auto populate the uh, local IP, it will just capture and will detect it. And you can select it. And now I can kind of control a lot of functions from here without touching the camera, right? So I can, you know, first of all, I can do a capture. You can kind of hear the shutter goes off and image comes through. I can kind of change the shutter speed. I can change the aperture. And, you know, so a lot of controls and, and down here we, we have the camera controls here. So all these are being done remotely without me touching the camera itself, okay? And if you are wondering, all right, what if I don't have a router, if I don't have a switch, I don't want to deal with a network, um, you can actually wire um, the Ethernet cable directly into your computer, okay? Uh, what that's going to do is the same idea. The computer is going to detect that local IP that's broadcast from the digital back and just connect to it. So all you really need is if you have the newer Mac Pro or a MacBook Pro that doesn't have Ethernet jack, you can get uh, uh, you know Thunderbolt 3 to you know 1 GB or 10 GB adapter. Um, that way you can just then run the cable because sec second benefit of Ethernet is that you can run the cable up to, I believe, 100 meter, which is total of 300 feet. You know, 300 feet is a, you know, a lot of distance. So that way you can make sure that where the photographer or where the set is, the digital tech can be a little bit further away. Um, so that's kind of the, some of the technology. George, have you any like on-set experience with uh, kind of this, you know, whether it's USB extension or using ethernet, you know, using it with, along, alongside with your clients? Yeah, totally. Um, one of the things I've been trying to do as much as possible is isolate myself from the rest of the crew, whether that's in a separate area of the studio that I surround with V flats or plexiglass screens, or whether that's in like a green room next door. Um, I think that's really helpful to, you know, create that separation. So having those long cable solutions has been great. Um, I have not had the chance yet to work on a uh, shoot using IQ4 uh, during the pandemic. So I haven't had hands on experience with those long Ethernet runs, um, but I have been using uh, some very extra long USB cables with the cameras I have been using. Um, and, you know, I, I wish I had that capability in, you know, some of these smaller format DSLRs to use the Ethernet tether and be even further away. Yeah. Um, monitoring becomes an issue at those distances, and we'll talk about some of the solutions that we could employ there uh, in some upcoming slides. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, as far away as you can separate your tech from your photographer, uh, I think that's you know desirable, and uh, Ethernet is a great tool for that. Yeah. Um, I see that there is a couple. Yeah. So with IQ4, the the interface itself is one gigabit, so 120. About you know when I transfer files, it transfers about 115 megabytes per second. Okay. Uh, so with the IQ4 file, it's about one second per file. And then, you know, give and take the, the hard drive writing and speed, you're looking at probably two to three seconds is actually showing up on your computer uh, itself. Um, since we're at this topic, George, there's a question for you. What brand of cable are you currently using? Uh, yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, this is a maybe a great time to plug um, Area 51 Tether Co., which is uh, a company that a friend of mine uh, recently started. He's uh, man, he's designed some really interesting uh, tether cables. He has a 33. He has the world's first 31 foot uh, USB C tether cable um, that has twin booster chips in it. So it has like full speed that you'd expect from a shorter cable. Um, and you know those are fantastic for IQ4 or any other USB C camera. He's got a few other solutions there, but I've in recent years moved over to those cables exclusively and they've been super reliable for me um and i believe they do ship to south africa um so yeah that's uh is it all right if i leave a link to that in the chat go ahead joe sure all right and um yeah i swear by those not sponsored or anything um and one of the things one of the questions we have asked is that you know when you tether through through Ethernet, um, you know, one of the things is like, you know, how do we get power? So that, that really depending, that depends on what kind of switch you have. Uh, some of the switch has, 
uh, what they call PoE, power over Ethernet. So if your switch does not have that, it will only provide data transfer, but it will not provide a charge to your digital back. So if your switch, and I think Brian in the chat talked about, you know, one a 10, 10 GB uh, adapter are very expensive, and that's true, but some of them uh, provides power through Thunderbolt C. So that, you know, if you want to kind of charge your IQ, not charge, but provide power while you're shooting uh, with your IQ4, that might be an option. I haven't seen one that does um, one gigabit while still providing PoE, but I could be just overlooking it. Um, so that's one of the consensus. So that when you when you start adding extensions, um, you know, power and data have different specs on what kind of cable you can use. So just kind of be aware of that when you start adding extensions and kind of keeping yourself uh, distance from, you know, uh, each other's uh, distance from uh, on the set. All right. So let's see here. And kind of one of the last options um, IQ4 has is, is wireless tether. And it's the same concept where instead of plugging into a wall on the IQ4, it essentially use a Wi-Fi signal uh, and then connects to your network. Um, the downside of that, uh, especially why, right where DT New York office is, is Wi-Fi interference. If you look at, you know, if you can see my screen, uh, if I just click on my Wi-Fi, uh, I turn my Wi-Fi off. But normally over here, I will have probably, you know, 100 or 50 kind of wireless networks I can connect to. And these are all creating interference, and that costs slowdown in terms of my uh, dedicated uh, transfer rate from the digital back to my computer. So, you know, if I'm using a cable and it runs about 115 megabytes per second transfer speed, on Wi-Fi, I've tested, and we have a pretty good Wi-Fi network here, and it, it takes, a, it's, it's doing about 20 um, mega, uh, megabytes per second. So we have large files of IQ4, which is 100 megabytes. You know, that's like a five second delay, five to six second delays at least. Um, so that's just something you want to consider. But for Wi-Fi, if you're shooting Sensor Plus uh, on IQ4, which is a smaller format, it comes in fairly quickly. And, you know, depending on job, that could be useful because that way you can have a camera that's kind of free form. You don't have to limit by cables and you don't have to deal with that, that constraint in that aspect. Okay. And Joe, maybe you can confirm this, but I have one client who shoots IQ4 now uh, who really hates downtime. And I heard from his assistant that um, you can actually use the Wi, you can connect a Wi-Fi tether and a wired tether. And if there are any issues with the wired tether dropping, it will automatically switch over to the Wi-Fi as a backup. Is that correct? That's correct. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I think that's super useful there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's one of the things and as well as the data transfer. You can, same thing if you're, let's just say your Ethernet or your USB drops out and you have cards in your digital back, it will trans start shooting to the car. And then when that connectivity comes back, it will ask you if you want to transfer all the shots you dump on the XQD car onto, into that session. So it's kind of a, a seamless workflow to, to have backup connections um, not just for that data, but also for kind of, you know, um, I guess it's just for data itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, if you're working, especially if you're shooting a celebrity that you might have five minutes with and, and really can't afford any sort of downtime, I think that's a great tool yeah. to have in the toolbox. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the tether options we have uh, with the, the phase system. Um, the next part is not just kind of on the camera itself, but all the other technologies around the, the camera. Um, so I think, you know, I'm going to let kind of George take over a little bit in this part because he has a lot more experience uh, on set than, you know, I have. And just kind of talk about, you know, camera itself is great, but once the image comes in, how do you deal with that when you when people are kind of all over the place, right? They could be kind of sitting at home. Sure. They could be, you know, in the next room. How do you handle that sort of image viewing experience through the different technologies? Sure, yeah. Um, 
Well, I think, like you said, there's two problems there. There's the problem of the people who are actually physically present on set being able to maintain social distancing. And then there's the problem of, you know, having a client who might be working remotely. And, um, you know, those are those two issues are solved separately, but kind of by similar means. So um, I think first we can talk about just real quick. Um, let me just look at my notes here. Uh, just, yeah, just real quick, like some of the ways that we can uh, have that monitoring on set for multiple people, you know, whereas before you might have had one monitor that your whole crew can kind of congregate around. Obviously, that's a problem now. Um, so I've definitely been adding uh, more monitors to my kit, be those additional ASO monitors, which I think we'll, we're going to get to in a minute, uh, or iPads. Uh, um, and there's a few different ways that, you know, you can accomplish running up to like 10 monitors that way. Um, and then there's also the problem, obviously, of uh, people being offset. So I want to focus in on the offset first, if that's all right. Is that what you want to yeah, kind of mainly yeah. talk about, Joe? Yeah. Um, so I think there there's there's two things. Like the, the biggest overall thing for me when I have a client working remotely is that I want to create a really immersive experience for them. I want to make sure that they feel like they're getting their money's worth and that they have the same level of involvement in the shoot that they would have if they were actually on set. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, all of us are still in the business of customer service and we want to keep those clients happy. Um, so I think there's three things that ideally you want to give your client who's offset. Um, the first of those, I think, is a good video feed of what is happening on set. Uh, there's a few different ways to accomplish that that we can go into more detail about. Um, the second is a live view of what the camp, what's actually coming in live in Capture One, um, like what they would be seeing um, on a monitor if they were on set. And then I think the third thing that's really important for them is to have the ability to kind of navigate images at their own pace uh, on their end, which is maybe something that we might not necessarily give a client on set, like complete control of Capture One, where they can go and rate and color tag at their leisure. Um, but when you're working remotely, I think that is really important. Um, and I think the concern there is that if we didn't give them that ability, they'd be constantly in my ear as the tech saying, go back three frames, go back three frames. Um, so I think figuring out ways to give all three of those things to your clients holistically um, is really important. And um, yeah, Joe, do you, sorry, do you want to kind of um, pick a, pick one of those topics to start? go a little bit more in depth on yeah. to start? So, I mean, like if we talk about like the, the general overview of the shoe, you can kind of see, you know, if you see my kind of webcam, you know, maybe, you know, if I move the closer, you can see kind of on set what's going on with the stylist, with the photographer. So that's, you know, what I think what George meant, uh, just like a, you know, kind of webcam, you know, wide angle shot of the entire set so that you know that people are working and then they can see that things are happening. And so they feel like part of the group. Um, you know, so I think that's the first thing. Um, and I would say on, just on that note, I would say one camera at a minimum, um, ideally in the setups I've been doing, you've had one camera that's like showing the set what what the talent's actually doing. Um, I also like to put a camera on the photographer so that the client can see them directing remotely. And then you might also want to have an additional camera in like the hair, makeup, wardrobe area. Um, and the easiest way that I found to do that is just to run an iPad at each one of those locations running. I, I've been mostly using Zoom, but um, you know, whatever video conferencing app you like, you can just make each one of those iPads a participant. And then the client can see all of those views simultaneously. They can pick one to pin themselves if they want to you know, focus on a certain thing. Mm -hmm. um, so after trying some much more complex setups with like multiple you know, HDMI connected cameras and switchers and all of that, we kind of discovered that the iPad solution uh, just works the best. So that's kind of what I would recommend everybody uh, look into if you do have a client that wants to work remotely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for I think for the the second part, you're talking about the kind of the the live um, live live feed of Capture One itself. Right. So what we're talking about essentially is kind of what we're doing right now of screen sharing. Right. So if I can share this to a client. Uh, they can see the shots as they're coming in and, you know, so that, you know, they, they might not have the ability to navigate to see before and after, but they can see as the images are coming in and see if it's a little bit darker, a little bit brighter. I think the suns are changing 
quite quite quickly here in New York City. So my exposure needs to be adjusted a little bit. But you know, you have this this view. So what George talked about earlier was you know kind of each station based on uh, each person's role. And now we have a focus on the photographer or the digital tech on the image itself, on how they're coming in uh, as you know lights change and lighting setup changes. And I think the third part we're talking about is for the client who are offset have the control over um, Capture One through Capture Pilot, okay? So what we're looking at, if you take a look at my screen right now, is normally when you have Capture Pilot, um, you can broadcast a local you know, IP and you have to be in here internally to use Capture Pilot and to kind of connect to Capture One. But through a service called NROC, uh, that's NG, NG, N-G-R-O-K. Yeah, NROC. Uh, essentially, it just port, it's, it's like a port forwarding service that allows other people who are off location get a secure connection to our internal, uh, you know, shoe. So let me see if I can pull up um, real quick my uh, address here. So. So for people who want to like test this out, you can right now actually type that URL into your web browser and you can actually see the shoe. And I just, I, you know, disable the rating and, oh, I did it, but I'm going to disable it now. I, um, you can see the images as they're coming in. Okay. So as I'm shooting. This was also what I was talking about in terms of giving your client the ability to uh, navigate and browse the session remotely. Um, by doing this uh, with Capture Pilot, you, you should be able to see if you're looking on this link, um, you have the full ability to navigate through this whole folder, yep. uh, choose which image you wanna see. Um, so yeah, as Lewis mentioned, like this, um, Oh, okay. So Laura asked, the link's getting overloaded. How many viewers can usually look at these NGROC links? Now, uh, Joe's using the free version of NGROC, which does limit uh, the number of connections that can uh, happen at once. Uh, I personally paid for this service, uh, which unlocks a few other features. Yeah. And one of those is uh, increased bandwidth. And uh, it seems to be more or less unlimited there. I know that Capture Pilot itself, I believe, supports a total of 45 clients. Mm -hmm. Um so that might be the issue that we're running into there since there's so many people uh, who might be looking at it but um in terms of ngrok the bandwidth is pretty much unlimited with the paid version um i'll also mention that ngrok uh, is all a command line interface so uh, it's something that you know if you're not super computer savvy might be a bit of a learning curve for you um but it's uh, if you do know a little bit of your way around terminal, uh, the instructions are pretty easy to follow, um, and it's pretty straightforward to get it up and running. Yeah. So let's see here, George. I just sent you a link. Can you? I just want to kind of demonstrate. Since George is in LA and I'm in New York, I just want to you know let him connect to it. So as you can see, I'm allowing kind of him to access the shoe here remotely. So here, let me. Uh... Can I share my screen and show everybody what it looks like on the client end if people are having yeah, access? Yeah, let's do that. that. Yeah. So let me stop. Let's see. Share. Okay, everyone should see my screen now. So uh, can you see this, everyone? Um, so this is kind of what it, I mean, this is if you've ever used Capture Pilot Web before uh, on a local network, this is the exact same interface. Um, and you know, it's quite fast, even though I'm on the other side of the country, uh, it renders pretty quickly, quality is pretty good. And, uh, I can rate, I can color tag. So yeah, yeah I mean, this is pretty, th this is sharing capture pilot like this. I'll just add is something that, um, has always been possible via port forwarding. Um, but as digital text, if, especially if we're working in a commercial rental studio, we very rarely have access to uh, the studio's network in a way that would allow us to open up those ports. Um, so this has been kind of a challenge for years, even before COVID, to figure this out. And and thank goodness uh, we all found out about NGROC because this is, I think, a really big game changer. Um, 
for having remote clients able to navigate your session. And I'll also add that because this is Capture Pilot um, on the tech or the photographer's end, you have a lot of control over uh, what those clients are seeing as well. Um, whatever you, you can set Capture Pilot uh, to point to a specific folder, you can tell it to follow the capture folder, uh, or you can even put it in all images. So depending on, you know, what you want your client to be seeing on the other end, uh, you can limit it to a specific folder or not. Um, and I, I found that to be really helpful too, because you don't always want your client to be seeing every little thing that you've done. You know, maybe if you're shooting to the test folder, uh, you don't want them to be seeing your test folder. You want to give them access to the previous shot so that they can do their edit. Um, and I think it's great that all of that happens within Capture One uh, so that you have a lot of control of that on set. Um, yeah, so we've got a couple questions. I'm just going to answer Laura's question here. So the question is, oh, things are scrolling pretty fast here. Give me a second. Uh, so as one user changes rating, you will override another user rating, right? That is correct. Um, you know, so you will, you know, the way we use, you know, regardless of using NROC or not, like it's the same as using on local or over, you know, remote. You really don't want to give these control to too many people. Really, technically, you should only give it to one person who's make essentially the decision maker, right? You know, you give them a color, it's like whatever you like, tag it, you know, purple. And that way, later on, you can you create a smart album, all purple, and you know these are the shots maybe the producer like or the, you know, whoever's, you know, making these decisions. So yes, you can, they will override each other. Uh, the color tag and the star rating will not over, you know, you know, they can be separate, but if someone else rate over you, that will be overwritten. So one thing I'll also add is that you can password protect your capture pilot stream. So if you want to only give access at, uh, to certain people, um, that's a good option there. But yeah, there does have to be a fair amount of like trust between you and your client and to assign everybody that color tag and, and um, you know, it's not perfect, but it's a great solution. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Let's answer some questions. Do you run the NROC over the studio Wi-Fi or do you as a tech supply Wi-Fi on shoot? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, George, this, I'll, I'll give that to you. Sure. Um, that was something I was a little bit concerned about. Um, some of the studios obviously have like really good network security. Uh, so the, for the first shoot that I uh, used NROC on, it was actually a Quixote here in LA. Um, I was planning on supplying my own Wi-Fi. Uh, but I talked to their IT department and uh, they were not going to be able to give me an ISP connection over my own network. So um, I, I had to use their Wi-Fi. Luckily, their infrastructure was like super robust. The speeds were really good. Um, but I did run over there the day before just to make sure that NGROC wouldn't have any like security issues. Um, and it did not. And uh, one of the whole points of NGROC is to get around firewalls and NATs. So I have not been in a situation yet where um, it has not worked on the Wi-Fi that I uh, that is existing in the space, um, you know the other problem there with supplying your own Wi-Fi would be that you know even if you have your own network that you're running, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, do that if you're using Capture Pilot, you probably are supplying your own Wi-Fi network. Um, you know the problem there is getting internet onto that network, and that's the issue that I've run into with uh, you know studios IT departments. Because yeah, ideally I would like to have my own dedicated Wi-Fi network to be running all of this, but um, getting internet access on that network's been another story. And uh, you know if you're using like an LTE hotspot, um, speed's going to be an issue. You know you're going to run into data limits there. So um, yeah, I haven't had any trouble using studio Wi-Fi yet, and I think unfortunately where that's kind of going to be a, a limitation. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of last, you know, similar fashion, another question is, are there any known drawback using NROC as opposed to port forwarding is speed of, of, uh, affected? Um, you know, I think this was answered down below, but I just want to mention that, you know, port forwarding, essentially you're opening up your kind of internal network to outside people to connect to. What that means is that then, you know, anyone who can, uh, you know, guess that port, that they have access to your internal network. But if you kind of do it through NROC, you know, NROC is almost like the intermediary where they have uh, secure servers. So they, they have more security than if you just kind of open up the port. But if you have, you know, me, I'm, I know a little bit about IT, but I'm not a network engineer. So I can't like speak on that behalf, but just same thing as, you know, screen share and things like that. If there are tools that's already built, 
and that's secure, why not utilize that instead of you trying to, you know, figure it out and kind of leave yourself open to public and, you know, think, because there are shoots that are very need to be protected, right? You know, product launches and things like that and high, high, you know, high end clientele, George can probably speak about that. So you need to make sure that no one is able to access these things, you know, through kind of just, and, and not just open up your kind of internal network. Yeah, I mean, like like Joe, I'm also not like a network security expert or a network engineer, so this is a little bit beyond the scope of like my expertise. Um, as far as I know, in terms of like NGROC versus just strictly port forwarding, um, there, I, I don't know of any like limitations of NGROC um, versus just opening up those ports. Uh, but what I will say is that I think one of the major advantages of NGROC is the ease of use for the uh, user on the other end. Uh, Joe, again, is using the free version, so you'll notice that the link that he sent out is kind of a random uh, string of numbers and letters. Uh, but if you do get the paid version, it allows you to use custom subdomains. Uh, so on my shoots, I just make that, you know, brooksdigi.ngroc.com or clientname.ngroc.com. And um, it's just been like a, a way cleaner solution for the client uh, to be able to just click on a link and um, not have to really worry about anything else. In terms of the security, I mean, yeah, that is definitely a concern. If I was doing anything really, really sensitive, I probably would not be using this um, just because those concerns are valid. And I personally don't really know um, like a major way around this, as Brian mentioned here, uh, as long as SSL HTTPS is involved, you're good. Uh, yes, NGROC can send a secure HTTPS uh, link. So I, you know, I, I think it probably is a little bit more secure, um, but yeah, I don't know of any known drawbacks. Yeah. All right. Um, you know, so that's kind of the, the three topics that kind of George mentioned, right? The first one is the overall uh, set. Second one is what's going on with the, um, you know, the, the photographers, you know, what the screen share, what images are coming in and the adjustments. And the third one is through Capture Pilot Remote that you are able to um, kind of allow people outside the studio, have a little bit of control to see the previous shots and navigate a little bit through whatever you want them to see. Um, so that's kind of the all the, the three remote aspect so we'll do through you know a zoom or you know google meets for this you know the the set and screen share for the computer and capture pilot through mrock for remote access of a little bit of control of the shoe so that's kind of the three topics um, that we talk about so the the next point we want to kind of go into is what about on set right so when we are on set like george said you know, normally you have one computer and everyone, can, you know, maybe two, three monitors and everyone kind of crowd around that to see the images and so on and so forth. Um, how have you kind of handled the situation now, George? Now, you know, people can't really do that anymore. Um, how do you, mm -hmm. you know, deal with that on set while people still are interested to see the images and without being crowding over like single monitor and things like that? Sure. Um, well, I. First, it's always had to be a conversation with production. I'll start there. Um, I've been having to, you know, alert people that solutions exist, that this is actually a problem and kind of like sell people on this. Because I think as digital techs, we have that uh, knowledge of like options for technology that a producer might not have. So I think it's important to be like really communicative with your clients about uh, what you can provide them. And the big one is why. Um, so that's first. Second, I've really been... Um, I've been trying to use iPads as much as possible because I think uh, a lot of productions are obviously budget conscious. Uh, not everybody has the budget to rent five ASO monitors for a small editorial shoot. Um, so uh, I think there's a slide on this coming up. Uh, oh, Joe's still screen sharing. But yeah, basically, um, you know, there, there's there's iPads and there's ASOs and there's trade-offs to each. And uh, I think it's important to kind of understand who gets what. So um, in terms of the iPads, uh, one nice thing about those is they they're wireless, um, and I have I, I'm using uh, a Teradek Serve Pro, uh, which allows me to stream a wireless video to ten iPads at once. Uh, I won't really get into the details there, but just know I'm using ten wireless iPads with a video stream from my computer, um, and those are great for people who don't need a color critical display. It's great for a hairstylist or maybe a makeup artist or somebody in wardrobe department 
who just needs to see composition, how clothes are falling, how hair is working. Um, but again, not super color critical. So I don't necessarily want to be handing an ASO or an iPad, excuse me, to an art director or especially not the photographer or maybe the client video village. Um, so I've definitely been encouraging producers to rent, you know, at least two ASO monitors on every shoot. Um, and I've been at the very least trying to give one to the photographer and one to like a video village um, that people can kind of come up to one at a time if they need to, if they don't have an iPad. Um, also have to keep in mind uh, your cabling if you're not doing wireless stuff, uh, because, you know, I, I used to carry 25 foot display port cables in my kit for my monitors that worked great for most situations before COVID. But now I've swapped all of those out for 50 foot cables. Um, and just trying to, again, increase that distance from the cart uh, that everybody else on set. And, and you know, it, it, the environments are set up differently now where you do have to have things further away because different, uh, you know, um, departments are isolated in different areas on a lot of shoots now. Um, so, yeah, making sure that the cabling uh, is in your kit is important. Um, looking into buying more iPads maybe. I mean, I had like two iPads in my kit before this and now I've, I have five and, they, and they've been going out on every job. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, Joe, you want to add anything or yeah, uh, so ask any questions uh, I there? Think, you know, on set, like George mentioned, you know, for non-color critical work, iPads are fine just as to see, you know, framing or, you know, composition, things like that. Uh, but when we, when we talk about color critical work, we're talking about ISOs, um, you know, the, the, the one thing you need to kind of watch out for is that not, not any computer can run five ISOs at a time, right? Like, yeah, right. It's, Good point. It's super graphic intensive. Um, so you need to kind of, you know, make sure that if you, you know, the, the client said, yeah, I'll do, you know, I'll do three, four ISOs so that we can all use it. Make sure your computer can actually handle that, right? George himself right now is running, uh, you know, the, the newest Mac Pro, which he can handle you know, has two graphics cards, right? And like four, four or five ports on it. Yeah, I, I have, um, I put in an additional graphics card in my Mac Pro. So I think I can handle up to seven or eight monitors off that computer. Um, but I wanna, uh, Peter asked a great question here that I think is, really relates to this. If we can kind of tie this into our response here. Yeah. Um, how have you navigated pricing for all the additional iPads, monitors, et cetera? Do you feel your average rate has shot way up for dealing with all of this or is production sacrifice running other kit? Great question. Um, you know, budgets are tight for everyone right now, being in a bit of a financial crisis and, uh, you know, having an unknown future ahead of us. A lot of clients, I think, are um, being very careful about how much money they're spending. Productions are definitely on shoestring budgets and every department has increased expenses right now, whether that's for, you know, disposable hair and makeup products, additional PPE, hand sanitizer, et cetera. So um, I've been had to, I've had to be kind of firm with producers and say, look, I'm, I'm not really um, I'm not really interested in working on this job if you're not going to um, make sure that we can make it as safe as possible and that's going to cost money. And most of the producers I worked with have been pretty receptive to that. But um from conversations I've had with other techs, I just I think it's really important to like be firm about that and um, and yeah, make sure that you're pushing those solutions. Um, so it it's been a little bit of a tough sell, but I I, I will tell you, Peter, that I have um, I've had a few jobs where the rate that production has come to me with was too low to handle all of this extra equipment requirements, and I countered with a much higher rate that was accepted, and I think that um, people are receptive of that right now. The other problem with that is, you know, the Mac Pro is an expensive rental <laughs> and uh, most of my jobs still clients prefer to, you know, go with a laptop option because it's cheaper. Um, I can pretty easily run like three monitors off my laptop if, if um, you know, the photographer is not like a machine gun shooter uh, and I don't need that extra graphics power. But um, yeah, I mean, doubling the price of the computer rental is definitely a tough sell. So I think it's about, um, you know, having those conversations a little bit more in depth than we might have had before COVID. Like I, I've definitely been on way more pre-production calls with producers discussing these issues uh, way more so than I would have last year. Um, and I, I, again, it's just about like being a good salesman and making people understand why this is important and um, without, you know, confusing them with overly technical jargon, like explain, explaining in good layman's terms, like what those limitations are and why you need more money to get around them. And yeah, no, it's tough.
Yeah. Um, but the, it's it's business, you know. Very good. Um, kind of one thing we uh, kind of skip over, like screen share and team viewer. So you know, we, we talked about a little bit about that, but you know, with um, people are working from home and whatnot. TeamViewer is actually a very good option if you need to, as a tech, you need to control a computer offset. Uh, this will allow you to kind of tech offset without being on set, right? Like you can, uh, whatever computer is on set, you just have a, a channel to TeamViewer into it and you have the full control to kind of do any sort of backup or do any, any, any sort of adjustments that need to be done on the computer. So that's a little bit different than screen sharing, right? Screen sharing is just kind of sharing a screen, people can watch it, but with uh, remote control, uh, team viewer is one, I know, um, go, to me, go to me has one. Uh, uh, Apple has it built in. I mean, uh, as long as you, the person on the other end is logged into their iCloud account, you can just open up the screen sharing app, uh, search for it in Spotlight on your Mac and uh, type in their iCloud account and you can screen share uh, very little latency, high quality. That's my favorite one to use. Um, and when I have issues with that, I will do, um, I'll, I'll do team viewer. There you go. But, um, another, just to add on to that, I actually had a shoot where we had a pre-light day where the photographer was actually off site on the pre-light day. Um, so once they, uh, once we were at a point with the lighting where we felt comfortable showing them, I actually had them hop on a screen share and gave them control and let them do all their own uh, color adjustments in Capture One to really dial in the curve. Um, so I thought that was a pretty cool use of that too. There's there's a lot of different utility for um, those screen shares. Mm -hmm. And like Joe mentioned, you know, uh, if you're a photographer, uh, let's say you're doing a high volume e-com shoot in your home studio and you don't necessarily need an assistant, but you also might be handling 80 or 100 products and uh, you want somebody to organize all those files for you, you can have an offsite digital tech tap into your computer and, um, you know, run capture one and, and do all your file management for you completely remotely. Yeah. Very good. Um, yeah, I think we answer, <clears throat> answer most of the questions. There's some question about terror deck and we can, we can save that for later. Uh, we can say those, we can go over that later yeah. or you can, you know, if you, I'm always also just, I'll mention, um, available on email. I think Arnaud I'll put my email in the chat, email or Instagram DM. I'm very responsive there. If anyone has any specific questions about Teradex and Grok, et cetera, happy to answer. Yeah. Um, so the, you know, the, the next part I want to kind of quickly mention is, you know, with Capture One, you are able to control a couple of functions, a lot of functions through, uh, through the software without touching the camera. Right. So, and that's, that's important to to understand so through capture one as you can see right now let me just share my screen real quick um so what you see here is just you know the capture one itself and what i have i kind of took the the tools out on the, the the right hand side here so what you see is a full adjustment so you can see my screen and you can also see the camera itself so Based on the adjustment I have, so I'm just going to bump up the ISO to a little bit higher, uh, and then drop down my shutter speed. And you know, so at this point, I can't even lock up my mirror, reduce vibration, and take a shot. Okay, so and the images will come in. So I have a lot of control remotely without touching. So let's just say if I have a still life shoot, really, the stylus can be over there mapping out their the shots they have an ipad to see how they're framing but i can control all the camera settings on this end i can even control the focus all right so if i go into live view here you can see uh in iq4 i have focus peaking right you know so at this point i can zoom in and let's just say i want to focus on you know this back corner here and let's see focus And with kind of focus peaking, you can quickly see where the focus sits. And then at this point, fire off a shot, right? So for, for a tech or a photographer to use these tools in Capture One without actually touching the camera, you know, sometimes your camera's all the way up six, you know, 12 feet off, off the ground, you know, you don't want to touch that. But this way you can, you have a lot of controls here, right? I can, you know, within the camera setting itself, I can change how it's being powered up, 
uh, shutter speed, aperture, and kind of all that uh, scenario. So definitely if you shoot, and if you usually don't tether, look into tether option in Capture One, because that's what Capture One was. Capture One started off as a tether software and then becomes a, kind of a raw processor, right? So Capture One's tether capability is far more superior or more powerful than you know, Lightroom has to offer. So if you're not aware of this, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you can kind of go over here without using or physically touching the camera. Uh, you have anything to add on that end, George? Yeah, sure. I mean, I just wanted to say, obviously, that functionality is useful for really useful for still life shoots like this one, um, whether you're in a pandemic or not. And, you know, I've been using this camera control for a long time. Um, I think it's a, an especially cool use of it now is, you know, let's say you're shooting a talent who's uh, particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, if, if they're older, have pre-existing conditions, and um, maybe you want to have everybody stay as far away from talent as possible. You know, you could set up a camera on a tripod and be able to look at live view and, and you know, control everything from a good distance. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of uses for this. Yeah. Um, and... And not just capture one in, you know, in the, um, let me just stop sharing my screen here, presentation. So, you know, we have focus speaking, camera setting, exposure, and all that, but there's also application to control the lights that's around the subject or around the, the, the set, right? For pro photo, you can control it from the XF camera itself. Or if you have a pro photo dongle, a USB dongle, you can plug that into your computer and over the network, you can control your pro photo lights. You know, if your lights has um, air, air, uh, air remote built in. Okay. Uh, for brown color, you have the ability to download an iOS or Android app and a lot of heads has Wi-Fi built in already. So then that way you can control the lighting ratio without kind of going over, walking over there and change those settings physically. And that also avoids touching buttons. That means less clean up afterwards, right? So as much remote control, whether it's on software or on hardware as possible, that, you know, that just a couple of ways to keep everyone on set safe, um, still maintaining a proper, you know, good workflow. Um, totally. So that's pretty much all I have, all we have here. George, do you have anything uh, else that you want to add in terms of kind of just like real world examples that we didn't, didn't mention, um, you know, hardware wise that um, we want to kind of talk about? Um. I think we pretty much, I mean, we pretty much covered everything I've been doing in the real world. Um, I just think the biggest takeaway here and from conversations I've had with people who've been trying to set up their own streaming solutions is you know, none of the technology that we've talked about today is new. Um, nothing's like novel or difficult to use here. Um, I just think it's, they're, they're all put together in really creative ways. Um, so I think that's, you know, we're all creative people, we're all artists. And I think a big takeaway here is like, use what you know, um, use what you've got, come up with creative solutions to big problems that we're all facing for the first time together. There's no industry standards here yet. Um, everything is still in beta, yeah. I like to say. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that what we've laid out here is a really great guide and a good template um, for some ideas that you might uh, try yourself if this is new to you, but like, be creative. There's no rules. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Louis uh, using mobile hotspot. Yeah. One thing I found actually, that's what I'm, I'm running right now. If you look at my camera right now, that's I'm using currently my cell phone mm. as a webcam because I couldn't find, couldn't buy a webcam. So, you, you know, if you're trying to be on set and try to use, like there are applications that you can download. And as long as you have a old laptop, old phone, you can use them as webcams so that people can have access mm -hmm. um, the shoots itself. Um, yeah, even this camera here I'm using is an old Canon DSLR I've had sitting on my shelf for years, yeah. and um, now it's now it's a live streaming cam. <laughs> um, I, P Peter brings up a good point here that I saw a couple people um, ask earlier too, and that's uh, whether or not I use a secondary tech. Um, really great point. I think especially with some of these more complex live streaming setups, once you're getting beyond two or three cameras, um, 
it really does necessitate having like an assistant or somebody that can kind of run that live stream. Um, again, I think that's going to be more on those like big studio jobs with where you have a huge budget and a really important client on the other end and nothing can go wrong. Um, but I think that for a lot of like smaller setups, um, especially if you only have a crew of a few people and maybe one or two people on the other end, um, as long as the, the shot list isn't too crazy or the schedule is too intense, I think that these are mo things that a tech can probably handle pretty easily in addition to their normal work workload. Um, but yeah, I, I, the first time I really tried a big streaming setup with like four cameras and, and discrete audio at each camera, it, it was a nightmare. I needed a full day to set up on, we had, luckily we had a pre-light day, but it took the entire pre-light day to set up the stream. And I was running around like a madman constantly all day. So in the future on these bigger streaming setups, I'm definitely gonna be pushing for a dedicated streaming operator. Uh, let's see, Richard asks, what do you use to plug in your external camera into your computer? So I'm assuming, George, you have a kind of a, a streaming deck kind of you can plug into? Yeah, um, I'm currently, well, it's really overkill for just what I'm using it for right now, but I'm using a uh, Blackmagic A10 Mini, uh, which is a really popular solution. Um, that one's great because it allows me to do four HDMI inputs. Uh, I have physical buttons to switch between the cameras. I can add in still images, uh, graphics. Uh, I have a lot of audio control. Um, so I was thinking that this was going to be a great uh, solution for these multi-camera live streams. Um, like I kind of alluded to earlier, it turns out that it's kind of overkill. Um, it really requires that dedicated operator um, audio issues are still kind of a thing. And um, I think that just using iPads is gonna be a lot easier. Um, but yeah, it can be kind of nice to have like one really sharp, good, clean feed, uh, especially for your like set overview. And for that camera specifically, I don't think it's, uh, I, I don't think it's crazy to use a DSLR or a dedicated video camera for that. Um, and a simpler solution than the ATEM would be to get like an Elgato um, what is it, Stream Deck or a Blackmagic mini recorder, or just a simple HDMI uh, to capture card um, to get that camera feed into the computer as a webcam. So those are all pretty hard to come by right now. Um, everything's sold out, but um, yeah, if you're looking to like up your game and give your clients a really clean video feed, I'd definitely look into getting uh, an HDMI capture card. Uh, let's... And correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but I think you could also use the HDMI out on the XF uh, or on the IQ back and give your client like a really clean video feed of live view instead of using it directly in Capture One over USB. Is that correct? That's correct. You can yeah. output HDMI directly into a monitor, but I never tested it with a capture a capture deck. So, but uh -huh. you know, the the only problem I see that run into is that you are you know essentially utilizing the live view resource on the back, so it will, it will probably eat up mm -hmm. your battery a lot if you just try to run that and capture simultaneously. Copy. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Just one more question here. Uh, let's see. With TerraDeck and iPad, do you have a dual monitor setup, uh, and then have the viewer window as one? That you are mirroring to all the iPads. Yeah, that's usually the setup. Um, whether or not I have a second monitor on my cart and I can actually see that viewer window kind of depends on the budget and the environment that we're in. Um, but yeah, I usually like to set it up as a second monitor uh, with a clean Capture One viewer, and that's what I'm streaming to all the iPads and to whatever client monitors um, I'm using. Uh, and, and also, oh, sorry, I just wanted to mention earlier too, um, when we were talking about screen sharing, uh, one of the things I really like to do, and I, I know Zoom does this, I know a couple other um, you know, pieces of software can do this, but I like to share, I, I, instead of sharing the whole Capture One window with all of the tools and the browser and everything, I like to make my screen share just the viewer window. And in Zoom, you can actually select a specific application window to share um, and, and I just think that is a lot, a much cleaner solution because it lets me do, um, chrono sync and all the other things that I need to do outside of capture one, uh, without the client seeing all of that. So, um, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of clean viewer windows. Yeah. I think if you use Google me, you can even share a tab, which is kind of mm -hmm. uh, want to share something like this. So you have share application, share tab or share the entire window. So you have a lot of options out there. Um, 
Yeah. So, and for I think Laura had a question about remote uh, shooting. You know, with limited Wi-Fi, um, that's just going to be a toughie uh, because really everything is based on the the signal strength, right? Like right now, what we have here, everything's kind of hardwired, and even then, there's some kind of a signal degradation over time. So, if you're running into a spotty Wi-Fi, you know that means that LTE is not going to cover it. I don't know, you know, you could look into 5G based on the location uh, and see how that works. But, you know, right now 5G is limited as well. Mm -hmm. So really at that point, you're the, you're at, you know, if you're remote, you're at the mercy of what's like on, on set for you. Um, we, yeah. we not well, and it, it, to set. It depends like how remote you are too. Cause I, I have an LTE hotspot and um, if I, and I have like a external antenna on it and I've been looking at cell tower maps and like aiming it and um, I can get speeds close to a hundred megabit on that. Um, at, like a hundred down 25 up. And that's totally sufficient to run zoom. I mean, granted I'm like in the middle of a big city. So um, if you're out in the desert or the mountains or something, that's a different story. But it, it's definitely possible to do some of the streaming like on location um, if you live in an area with good cell reception and have like a dedicated hotspot. Uh, but it does use a fair amount of data. Zoom uses like a gigabyte per hour for a two camera session. So it's really important that you're having people on the other end turn cameras off. Um, but and, you know, not something I would want really want to do, but it's totally possible. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, that's it for kind of us, you know, as George said, you know, we're all kind of going through this together. And, you know, if you have any questions or even, you know, suggestions, email uh, me or George directly. Uh, if you're interested in, you know, looking at ASO options or thinking about testing out, you know, the Ethernet options for IQ4, you know, give us a, give us a call, let us know. Uh, you know, I think technology is moving away and moving faster and faster where we are able to do these type of shoots with, you know, uh, one gigabit. And I know uh, for kind of phase one industrial side, they have 10 gigabit connection cameras that allows you to have really fast connection uh, in terms of tr uh, file transfer. So there's a lot of options out there and, you know, any questions, let us know. And then uh, thank you for attending and thank you all for coming and being engaging in the chat. Thanks everyone.